So the main video on the channel this week is just a little bit different. It's going to be all about the AR, VR, mixed reality headset. And if you've been following the channel at all this year, you'll know that Marcus and I have done an awful lot of work together. Marcus, how are you? I'm all right. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Really good. Really good. So it's, it's yeah, this is the final video we're going to put out before WWDC at least. And we'll give uh, people that are watching the video an idea at the end of something else we've got up our sleeves. But you and I this year have kind of uh, formed a bit of a, an alliance. And we've, we've managed to <laughs> crack a few nuts open and get the your renders have just taken Twitter by storm. And they've been used in so many places. I know it's been really, really odd, you know, and just something that was a passion project turned into a collaboration with you has turned into something else, you know, um, but it's been fantastic. I've loved connecting with the community, most of all, all these people that are really passionate about products um, and just wanting to know what comes next. So it's been really great to get involved in that. Because, of course, that's the thing. Not only are you a, 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 a you know, really talented renders artist, but you're a massive AR, VR enthusiast, particularly AR enthusiast as well, aren't you? Which is where this is really nestled in for you. And because, as you say, when I look at the community that is with you on Twitter now, you're all talking, excited, really getting behind this product launch. So, And we're nearly there after nearly 10 years. Can you believe it's nearly there? I know. I know. And been following it for this long. I mean... And I'm I'm also interested in, like you've just said, I'm a massive kind of AR VR fan. I think it really is the future. Uh, I I think you know I'm I'm very interested in a lot of the products that are out there. I have a Quest here and the original CV and Vimax as well. And I just think that this product will give kind of the market a push. VR was has always had a bit of a hard time out there, um, and I think this is it's going to kick it along. You know. I I so why do you think it has been so slow in catching us? It's just been that technology hasn't really been good enough to capture the imagination until this point? I think it's a mix of things. I think the techni technology kind of just breached a barrier recently, which was kind of enough to get the average person interested or at least an enthusiast in, say, gaming and something like that. But really the, the form factor is, you know, when we think of consumer devices like a mobile phone and how much technology is packed into there and how it works, the idea of having kind of like big goggles, especially something like, you know, the Quest 2 there, it's quite a big device and it's, it's just not something that you can practically wear every day. So it really is an enthusiast kind of device. And I think what Apple will release will be much closer to something consumer, although I don't think it will be there yet. I still, it's it's not glasses, you know, it's still going to be goggles in, in some shape or form, but I think it will do a lot to kind of push that along and, and make people see the value of it. The other thing is the software. There's been a huge kind of like gaming focus in the in the VR and AR world, but I, I really see there being some fantastic productivity kind of um, gains there. We just haven't seen kind of good enough software, in my opinion. I'm sure there are lots of people who are using technology that's out there right now. But as, as kind of someone who works in industrial design in 3D, I really want kind of like native 3D applications. And the closest I have to that right now is Gravity Sketch. And it's something I use every day, you know? So so we're going to begin to try and work through, because as I said, this is going to be the last video that comes out after all of this time. And oddly enough, am I right in thinking that the headset actually comes out on your birthday? <laughs> I'm not sure is if it's fact? coming out on the... <laughs> well, I'm not sure it comes out on the fifth, but... Yeah, that that it will be my thirtieth birthday on the fit, which which is just a completely bizarre thing considering how long I've been waiting for this. So, so Tim's giving you the presents, good... presents, and what we're going to try and do now, we're, we're pinning our colours so. to the mast here. Come come Monday week, or today week as we record it, we could be looking fools, but we're going to try and nail our colours to the mast now and give all the latest information that we've heard that you've heard that we think is possible to actually come through and make this headset the astonishing headset that we're expecting it to be so a lot of this is going to be because you've got such knowledge about it that i just really want to hear what your take is on a lot of these functions that we're hearing about so first of all the name now that's changed through the course of this year you now seem to think it's probably going to be called reality pro right i mean i mean when there's so many leaks in place and so many big names coming out and saying that this is what it's going to be called then I guess this is what it's going to be called. I just, I really just didn't think that Apple would go that direction because, of course, 
pe people are already worried about the way that technology kind of envelops their lives, right? And calling mm -hmm. a product Apple reality basically says you're going to be enveloped in our reality. And I think that conjures the wrong kind of kind of idea in people's minds. So I, I really thought, uh, there's a old video with Steve Jobs where he, he first talks about this product. You know, he talked about how the iPod and headphones were kind of like a studio for your ears. And what he really wanted to do was kind of like, um, the same thing, but for for television, for your eyes. And, you know, can we bring this theater experience in the same way that you do with music? So I always thought, I always saw this as kind of like an evolution of television as, as this product. So I, I always thought that they would call it something like Apple Vision. Um, mm. that, that just makes sense for me in terms of like w what it is and where it goes. But, you know, the, this crack team into Apple, if they think that Reality Pro is what's going to push this along, fair enough. But, I mean, we also see kind of uh, trademarking in this where they've got like XR OS, you know, which is going to be their extended reality OS, which mm -hmm. is the software that runs all of this. So which will come maybe it'll yeah, be yeah. called, yeah, maybe it'll be called Apple XR or I, I'm, I'm really not sure, but it seems like it's going to be reality pro because also the I'm, reason why it's going to be called pro is apparently there's a, um, a lower spec device coming later, which will just be called Apple reality. And this is reality pro. And two things is going to bring up now first of all from what you were saying just a moment ago are you hoping and anticipating that you'll be able to wear this for a lot of your productive day your working day i mean that would be my that would be my dream but i honestly don't think this will serve someone like me in terms of that i think you you're kind of average like when if you don't need much processing power and things like that because i i have to have quite a powerful computer to do mm -hmm. my work but mm -hmm. I think if you're someone who uses a laptop or something like that, I think they're going to have some productivity tools in place, which is going to make your workflow great. And I also think that this product would have been perfect for the kind of work from home movement, you know? Of course, uh, yeah. It really could have capitalized on that because it, it ties in a lot to kind of that entertainment or kind of living space. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Unfortunately not. Um, maybe, maybe in the future, processing power is just not there yet. And price-wise, you've worked it out that the cost of this to Apple is around about sixteen hundred dollars, right? With all the components that you know they're using. Yes, as 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 close as we can get it. You know, we, I yep. used previous products and things that uh, were available online, and um, but you know, it's still a guess. But actually, this it corresponds with information that was released from a consortium of um, uh, makers in China, who basically the part of the supply chain, and they they all know the prices and they came up with kind of like a document that said it should cost apple about fifteen hundred dollars uh you, you you have to price in things like r d costs and all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff um so i have around sixteen hundred at cost um but you know apple usually do kind of like a 2x when it comes to profit so that's where that kind of three thousand number came from i think in in the origin now the the there's talk of the fact that they might release this product at cost um i don't know if they will do that personally because um palmer lucky kind of came out and said the other day and i think it's a really good point that uh apple will make this something that you desire before you it's something you can afford and so even selling at like 1600 is kind of something that's more affordable than 3000 so I, although it might be counterintuitive i think by putting the price of something like 3000 you limit it to really hardcore enthusiasts who are not going to yeah. kind of treat it like a normal consumer device and i think that's also another reason for calling it pro and not like just reality because they, they really want to make sure that you understand that this is kind of like a new oh, device that is coming out yeah coming out kind of earlier than it should which is something that apple doesn't usually do and they, they just kind of want to make sure that people understand like your average person shouldn't get this yet but we want you to to desire it you know um so I, I don't know, um, but between sixteen hundred to three thousand is what I would say. I mean, if they come on stage next week and suddenly say that this is coming out at sixteen hundred, I think that will absolutely floor everybody. Because for the longest time now, we've all been expecting three to three and a half thousand dollars, and we know they're kind of willing to take a bit of a hit on this because of what it means to them, and we know it's not going to be a profit maker certainly because of all the R and D and ten years worth of research that's gone into it. Then, and I think the units they're expecting this first year, a hundred thousand units, something very low, aren't they? Yeah, very low, which w which would, in my mind, go towards the 3,000 side of things as opposed to the 1,600. Um, 
Or it, or it could be that they're doing a low production run so that they don't have uh, too much of a profit loss. But, uh, yeah. you know, for a company like Apple on a launch like this, I wouldn't see that being too much of a problem. So let's begin fleshing out some of the details and if we begin looking at the actual hardware itself, you kind of worked out that you think they're going to be really lightweight. I mean, I've had about 300 grams, which is cheaper than, Air, uh, cheaper, lighter than AirPods Max. I mean, it is very light. If that's a, a full-in headset, that is super lightweight. Yes. I mean, I would say, I would even say sub 300 grams, you know, um, mm. when it comes to kind of uh, these things that make products like this wearable all day, lightness and comfort is kind of like right at the top of the list. You know, you can have as good a screen as you want, but if you can't wear it all day, there's no, you kind of lose out on that function. So I, I think it's a big part of why, you know, for instance, they took the battery out of the headset as we're hearing and things like that, to really bring down this weight and make it as light as possible. Um, something along the lines of uh, big screen VR. I don't know if you've seen this one recently. Then you heard something mm. that came out from mm. them. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's massively a product. Yeah, I mean, the fact they got it down to that kind of weight, because yeah, you and I both printed out 3D. What we, I put a video a couple of weeks ago. You sent me through your renders, and I actually had some printed out. And so we've got an idea of, of the kind of dimensions that we expect in these goggles to be. And there you go, yeah. And certainly, the, the, I mean, look at how slim they are. Yeah. So I, would, I, so I, I, I was optimistic with that uh, thickness, but, uh, you know, I did model it with the correct uh, dimensionality, but I kind of applied an optimism from Apple's kind of masterful technology. So it's, it's hopeful. It, it's probably is going to be a little bit thicker than this, but I imagine some work clubs. Because funny enough, when when I got my set printed out, my pair printed out, the first thing you said to me, I don't remember, was, are your eyelids, your eyebrows just brushing, your eyelashes just brushing the inside of the lenses? I said, yeah, they are. I said, perfect. That shows we've got the dimensions around about right. And we'll, we'll come back to the importance of that, the uh, IBD, a little bit later on. But you're expecting there to be 4K per eye and micro LED screens, yeah? Yes, uh, so this is they're going to be using a combination of uh, micro LED screens, which are uh, micro or LED screens, which are incredible technology. They're incredibly dense uh, displays, uh, and I believe the first one they're going to be using is from Sony. Um, 4K per uh, 4K per eye is going to enable amazing content, and they're going to be pairing them with something called Pancake Optics, which is a brand new type mm. of optics that's been developed that kind of folds the light path uh, in on itself so that you can shorten it down. It kind of like bounces it backwards and forwards twice uh, and then into your eye, essentially. Uh, and what that means is that you can get much closer to the screen with the lens and therefore more compact. It also means that you don't need... Um, the lens technology before this was called Fresnel. And the way that Fresnel works is that it kind of cuts up a lens into layers and that spread out really. And that kind of like uh, bends the light, but you get these ridges. Pan uh, Pancake optics don't have those ridges, so you have this really nice kind of like clear lens. Um, and 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 that that's kind of like the state of the art right now. Um, but the the most important thing is something called uh, PPD, which is pixels yeah. per degree. Yeah. Which basically means like um, if I take a one arc degree, how many pixels can I see within that space? And the human eye can see six, 60 pixels per degree, right? Um, which means that, that that's that's our visual acuity. The, the combination of this 4K by 4K display plus this pancake optics, which apparently has 120 degree FOV for both of them over both eyes, should give us this is around a daft question. 30 What's, pixels per degree. Just a, a daft question, sorry to interrupt you. What's the human eye field of vision? Uh, it... It's about uh, 220 degrees, uh, 240 right. degrees. It's really quite large diagonally. Um, so when you talk actually, about six, each... so when you say about 60 pixels per degree, and we've got about 240 degrees, it, our eyes are taking in so much information. I mean, it's 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 a it's a huge amount of visual information. But actually, um, that we're going to get into the science of this here. But you you can, your brain actually hallucinates reality. It's built up a model of what reality is, and then your eyes only provide it with a very small amount of information to update that model. And so that's why you can do things like foveated rendering, where you only have to show the high, that super high pixel count at the very center of your vision, which is why things like eye tracking and things are really important because 
trying to fit. I think I think it was worth out something like sixteen thousand uh, k is what you what you need. <laughs> sorry, no, it's, uh, sorry, not sixteen thousand, sixteen k. It's uh, which is sixteen thousand pixels, but across it's massive, and it's just it's not doable by any sense of any technology today. So what we really need to do is like to use something like uh, foveated rendering when we bring that in. But back to what I was saying before, across 120 degrees on this headset, we're looking at about 30 pixels per degree, which is higher than anything that's on the market right now. Um, and, you know, should look very, very clear. It's not going to look quite as good as real life, but, you know, it's better than anything that's out there and enough to kind of get past that uncanny valley, I think, which is kind of probably is a, a benchmark for Apple creating this product. They needed something like 30 PPD. In order for it to be viable, or else, you know, if if it if it if it's so much worse than looking at real life, you're not going to wear want to wear it mm. for any amount of time. You mm. know what I mean? And um, so this is, this is really important. So then the natural lead on from what is going to be a huge part of the product, the the, the lenses, is onto the cameras and sensors, which again you put a lot of thought and worked out what you think is going to be. I mean, it's a massive amount. You're expecting 14 external cameras. Is that right? Uh, approximately yes I mean apparently there's been changes there, there was meant to be quite a few sensors also facing the user which is going to be for an important thing that we'll talk about in a second but yes I mean it's going to have a, a large number of sensors uh, apparently they've wanted to hide that under kind of this front screen that they have so there'll be kind of like a a, a black section of glass and my, I imagine that they'll hide the sensors kind of somewhere along here they'll also need sensors that can track like both up and down so you know, I thought they would hide it inside of the air vents that would be here. So again, you can't see them. And that's things like mouth tracking, feet tracking, looking at the sky to see what the lighting conditions are so you can apply it to digital objects, uh, things like that. Um, but a really big one that is going to be on this headset is, is uh, apparently anyway, is something called a front pass-through display. And the mm -hmm. idea behind this is that if you can show the user's eyes, you will... Uh, make it feel like they're less isolated to other people. But you also give the impression that the headset is uh, kind of hollow, which will help this idea of, of it becoming much thinner than it is visually. You know what I mean? Um, and so in order to do that, they have to get kind of like a good image, at least of your eyes or the information about your face. So I imagine that there will be some kind of camera either behind the lenses or here that will take in some data from your face. But then apparently they're combining that with sensors inside the kind of light seal that goes on top of the product here. This will have kind of like some slight movement sensors. So it will be able to pick up on your face movements, you know, when you move about. So your eyebrows and then apparently they have an and... AI model. Exactly, yeah. They apparently have an AI model, which then uh, interpolates that and then applies that to a kind of like a digital model of yourself. Um, which then gets used to both uh, digital avatars within the headset and also on this front pass-through display um, so that people can see it. The only thing we, one... I, I'm not sure about is... Go on. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's your pass-through image that you made for me back in, I think, January or February, that's the one that Sam Cole's been using an awful lot and got a huge amount of views on Twitter. So that's the we'll put that in so people can look at it, but that's the idea you've got of this pass-through idea, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's just, it will be kind of like, um, apparently they're using a curved AMOLED display um now the only thing we don't know about this is if you've got two people in the same room and they look at you from different directions they're kind of are, are you going to see kind of like flat eyes on the display i don't think that's going to be a very good experience unless of course they go for something like um the memoji eyes but mm. i very much doubt that they will do that it seems like not the right way so if you if you have two people looking at it from two different directions they're going to kind of see a bit of an odd image right so you could either have it so that you can talk to one person at a time and then it uses sensors to like see where you are and then trick you into thinking you're seeing an image from the right way. Or they might use something like a lenticular display or um, micro lenslets, which basically you put in front of a display like this. It will lower the resolution a little bit because you need multiple pixels under one lenslet. But essentially what it does is it kind of turns it into a bit of a light field and allows you to see it from multiple directions which would really kind of like sell this idea that you're looking through the headset at someone's mm -hmm. eyes. Um, seems a bit strange to us, but I think as soon as as soon as soon we see it, we're going to be like, ah, yeah, that makes total That's sense. Why. The headset looks thinner. 
uh, I can mm-hmm. I can totally communicate with someone in this, and I I think it will also do a, a lot to kind of um, calm the uh, that stigma of having something on your face. You know, it it will it will feel more like a cool thing with glasses. And of course, the combination of the AMOLED, which I think kind of lets more color and light come from different angles. My understanding of that is right. That in combination with the light field tech that you think awesome I've used. I mean, it's going to, we're going to mention about how FaceTime is going to have a huge bump up and importance on this, but that's kind of where light field and AMOLED come together, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I believe so. I mean, <laughs> I know, I know quite a bit about this, but not everything. And, uh, Probably. Um, my guess is that they're probably using that screen because it does have something like that wide color gamut and a, and a kind of a wide viewing angle, which would be really good. My guess is that they'll probably like split it up into like maybe six views or something. And as you move around the person, it'll kind of subtly change between uh, those and So views. onto IPD that we mentioned a minute ago, and I'm going to get the pronunciation right this time, into pupillary? Pupillary. Into pupillary. Into- Pupillary distance, yes. Into pupillary. So that's where when you sent when I printed them off and we had this pair sitting here and you said about touch up, that's where it's really important because again, I'm coming this from hopefully asking some of the questions that other people might not understand because not everyone's got the huge amount of knowledge that you've got. It's that that helps track the lenses to your eyes, exactly to your eyes, right? Uh, k- kind of. It's so it will have a a sensor, like I said, on that will have to look at your eyes, and I guess it's going to be used for multiple things. But when you go to put the headset on, it will look at where your eyes are, and then it will use um, small motors to kind of move the display. Mm-hmm. Interpupillary distance is like how far apart your eyes are, and so in order to maximize the viewing angle of the device, you need to have it as close to center as possible. So that's why uh, they will kind of move. And apparently they're using an, an electromechanical IPG adjustment, which basically means that it will do it motorized as opposed to you have a uh, move a dial, which is kind so of a classic Apple just it would out of calibrate mind, you know, Every time you put the headset right. on, it would calibrate itself to the center of your eyes. Yes, exactly. And I, I also imagine if you have any hard knocks, it will micro adjust the display. Yeah. But it also means that when you hand the device to somebody else, you don't have to worry about changing or knowing your IPD device will just update naturally to whoever's wearing it okay so onto the chips now what do you think they're going to be running um so i think this was sadly it's bradley who released this a very long time ago but apparently they're using a combination of chips now this this is really interesting because this the fact that they're using two chips is interesting because if if they could have, they would have done it on one chip, right? Where it includes everything that's specifically made for this product. And it would have been better because if you've got two chips, they've got to communicate over distance and all this kind of stuff. It makes it less efficient. Mm-hmm. And that apparently came from this, uh, where they thought it was going to be a device that ran from your computer and then it was going to be standalone. And so they, they didn't optimize it right from the start. So apparently they're going to be using an M2 chip for the majority of processing and things like this, or, you know, image processing uh, onto the display. And then they're going to be using another chip, something like an A17 Bionic, which will handle all of the sensor data. So all of your face sensor data, all of the cameras capturing your environment, the LiDAR, picking up your hand movements and things like this. Um, and they're, they're going to work in conjunction. But apparently they will be on the headset itself um, and not like in this external battery pack that we're hearing about. And you think it's going to have onboard cooling as well? As much they we're going to mention the battery pack a little bit in just a second, actually. But, okay, part of the moving the battery away from the head was for the weight and for the coolness. But even though they've done that, you still think the headset itself is going to need some active onboard cooling? Yes, uh, I- I mean, as far as as far as we understand, because you know, I think we've got two chips on there, right? Which mm. are very efficient, but we're, they're going to be pushed to their absolute limit, so they're going to be hot. Then you've mm-hmm. got two micro OLED displays with backlights, apparently, and an AMOLED display on the front there. Okay, these micro LED displays run very hot because um, we have they have to be run very very bright. Because the the optics, the pancake optics, in this motion of folding the light backwards and forwards, you actually lose some of the brightness of the light in order for that to happen. So we have to run these displays extremely brightly. This is a lot of heat. And then you've also got it on a person's face. That face generates heat in the eyes and things Mm -hmm. like that. 
So mm-hmm. you just absolutely, in order to get the best out of the device, you kind of have to have cooling on there. If, maybe if they'd had like a, a single chip and all this kind of stuff, they might have been able to do passive cooling. I know that, for instance, the Microsoft HoloLens figured out a way to do passive cooling, but they had like this phase shift cool. I mean, crazy tech. Um, I think this is probably the simplest way to achieve a good result. Uh, and the nice thing about having uh, passive cooling as well is that um, you can redirect some of this air to the user's face, for instance, right. which they have yeah. some of the patents for. Yeah. Where, where, where they can pass it around the eyes. Because if you've ever worn VR, you'll know that you get this giant ring around your face uh, after extended use. And I really don't think Apple want this as part of their experience. So so the batteries then, it's going to sort of be the size of an iPhone 14 Pro Max, that kind of size and weight. But importantly, most importantly, it's going to be able to be hot swapped. So there will be no interruption to your session when you're using it, right? Apparently so. Um if the information from Mark Gurman is to be believed, apparently you are going to have a battery pack that is connected uh, on the pack, but magnetic to the headset, right? So, so you like won't a MagSafe kind of thing. It. Yeah, like um, think about more like the MacBook chargers. Uh, you, right. Do you know how they have like those, it's yeah. like the white plastic, they have the little clips on the end and the rubberized bit. I imagine it's going to be something very similar to that. Uh, probably even exactly the same design language because if you look across all their products, all of these battery items are white like that, uh, even the one that fits on the back of the iPhone. So I, I think it's it's going to be like that. It's going to be able to fit in your pocket because that's mm-hmm. really important, you know, with an iPhone. Um, and yeah, my guess is you probably just be able to buy one for $150, $200 maybe. And yeah, but my guess is you're only going to need two, right? Because as long as one charges faster than it's used, then then you can charge one yeah. while you're using the other. Um, and we we talked about this. In, o- in order for that hot swapping to happen, you need a small onboard battery in the headset in order to facilitate kind of turn on, turn Swapping off, out. and pass yeah. over. Yeah. So it'll probably be something very similar to the AirPod Max battery. And audio wise. Headset. Is it going to be AirPods Pro? Do you think so? So, bit I've I've this I'm really not sure about because in the patents they they have like these uh, magnetic connectors on the side of the headband and things like that to for like additional audio options later. But they already have two great audio products out, like you just said, the AirPods Pro and the AirPods Max. So the device will have um, speakers on it, but which will give you kind of like that spatial audio experience. But if you want anything mm-hmm. private, like so that people can't hear what you're doing or even a, a kind of like a better experience, you'll use those. And I, I actually use AirPods Pro and AirPods Max with VR now, and, and they work very, very well. I imagine um, they would. I mean, so they're great I, audio anyway, so. Yeah. And also like this, you know, putting headphones over the top or anything, is quite fiddly, especially if you've got a band because then the headphones have to come up before the headset. So... Anything that is wireless that goes in your ears is, is a big win, basically. And before we get onto software, where we're just about to go port-wise, it doesn't need to be that many ports on them, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what I saw, apparently it's going to be powered magnetically uh, with kind of like a MagSafe thing, maybe with some kind of physical connection, which would be different than the uh, Apple Watch one. But appa- apparently there's going to be a... Um, a USB-C slot on there, which I find uh, very strange. Um, because I'd, I'd, I don't see why there would be uh, a USB slot on there. Is that firmware? <laughs> because Is that the I, thing I can think? Firmware updates, just quicker? Because, well, I mean... You- with AirPods, for instance, you're never quite sure when they've done their firmware updates. Maybe this is going to be a more no. secure wave. No, you, I don't know. Maybe, but, I mean, how many times have you updated your iPhone with a cable? <laughs> In the past yeah. five years, yeah, you just, you just, you just don't do it. So I find, I find that very interesting, and I have a little feeling that that might have to do with connecting it to a Windows computer. But that really is a dream. That is, that's it. <laughs> I just want to say that's just what I'm thinking, and I'm, yeah, it's yeah. just what I'm hoping. But I just, I don't see because, for instance, uh, they won't have the experience of having to charge this in headset battery, right? We talked about this. It would be something that it does it automatically when you put it in a case or something. So really, I'm I'm very confused about that USB slot. 
So as we kind of segue now between hardware into software, let's talk about how you're going to track it and use it. it, it are, are they, from what you're telling me, they're working on a standalone device that will be a controller down the line. But when it comes out, when we see it unveiled, fingers crossed, a week today, it's going to be relying on eye tracking, hand tracking, that kind of thing, I'd take it, yeah? Yeah, ap apparently so. Um, there are lots of patents around... Uh, controllers, gloves, and fingertip devices, but um, probably it's in order, like, they've done this with products in the past where they release it sequentially, and I believe that this is such a big product and such a big experience that they're going to want to simplify its onboarding, and I think they'll want people to get used to using it with this brand new gesture uh, system that they'll be creating before they get used to other things, basically. So as we sort of switch now from hardware into software, um, I know they're working, or you, you firmly believe they're working on a device that will be a controller down the line, but initially it's going to be very much for hand control, eye control, that kind of thing. That's what we're expecting to see a week today, right? Yes, I, I think um, to start they will do hand tracking as kind of like a evolution of the gestures that they created for iPhone and, and all, of the, all of their touch devices. And then I think at a later point when people have gotten used to these gestures and this technology, they will probably release um, other forms of input. But my, I, I imagine they're going to kind of set a new standard for mm -hmm. interaction in this space, which everyone is also looking forward to see how they do it, which will be an extrapolation of things that we already know. So, you know, I imagine pinching and grabbing and this kind of thing and air tapping. Um, but now we've got all this new information. We've got where you're looking because it has eye tracking. We can hear your voice. So... I really feel like we're going to move to this more fluid kind of uh, contextual computing, which will be very interesting. Um, I, I can't wait to see how they do it. So what do you think, uh, we'll work on the premise for now that it's going to be called XROS. I know there's been various patents thrown about, but for the sake of argument, we'll call it XROS. Um, what are you expecting to see when it is shown to us next week? What sort of, uh, if you can briefly describe what you think, you know, we're used to what iOS looks like and iPad OS. What do you think XROS will feel like and look like? I think that's a really hard question um, because I have like this mental image of what I want it to be, but I, I honestly don't think it's going to be like that. I kind of imagine uh, that it will be something a bit like um, watch away. Yep. Because this is something that's on your body. It's meant to be used in that way. I, I feel like they're going to extend that where it's kind of like, because you want minimal movement and gesture. If you've got your arms moving about like this, you really want, them to be doing as little as possible so I, I think it's going to be something along those lines apparently there you're going to be able to use to all of the ipad apps that are available right now within this space so there will be something very familiar to you where it will be kind of like 2d screens but in 3d that you can use but i really hope that they're going to extrapolate out into kind of more spatial gestures and movements and interfaces because i really feel like that's the, the joy of this medium is when you're able to kind of use things in the way that you your body naturally wants to mm. use things. Mm. That, that to me is far more interesting. It's kind of like um, when you use a hammer in real life, right? The hammer is so great and a lot of physical items are so great because they provide this amazing feedback loop, right? <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty harsh one because if you miss, you hit your fingers. <laughs> right <laughs> but it's it's also got this it's got a lever it's got like a long arm that allows you to give accuracy and it's just this perfect thing you do it once okay and this and then you keep doing it and you get much better at it and i feel like if you bring these principles into the 3d spatial vr space you're going to start to be able to do some amazing things you know so it's going to be very interesting to see how, how they how they handle this um but I'm not too hopeful. I'm imagining kind of like this 2.5D applications, kind of like flat almost, but yeah. in the 3D space. Of course, we mentioned FaceTime a little bit earlier on, and I can see how that is going to be an enormous player. If they can get FaceTime right, and then SharePlay comes along with it and so on, that could be a massive, massive game changer. If all the data they're capturing from your face can actually be passed through the headset to other users, it's going to be huge, right? Massive. Um, so apparently this headset can basically capture an almost photo real kind of avatar of you. 
Um, in order to do that fully, I think it's going to be something a bit like, do you know how you set up um, Face ID with your phone? Mm -hmm. How you kind of have to move your phone around your face to scan it. I imagine that you might even use an iPhone to scan your body, or you might turn the headset around and use its sensors to scan you, and then using that front display, they'll guide you to do it. It's another reason they might have the front display. But it will it will capture this kind of like photo real picture of yourself, and then it will use the AI to update that kind of model that it's made. So you can then use that in multiple ways. You could use it in this kind of virtual FaceTime call where you could have it in any background, or you could use it in a game, or you could use it in a virtual meeting space. Um, I think this is going to be a, this kind of like telepresence is going to be a really huge thing, especially if it looks and feels real enough mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that someone feels like right next to you. I think it's going to be a big one. And this also transfers into work. I was talking before about work from home. If you have good enough telepresence, there's nothing stopping you from setting up like a virtual office. You know, imagine I have my office here, I have my table, but I can digitally stitch another table and another worker next to me and create this new space where people can work across the planet in this kind mm -hmm. of like telepresence while having the comfort of your own home. I think this is, massive business i mean this is that that would be interrupting huge sections of infrastructure which is big money and um, which i know was essentially meta's facebook's original plan you know they wanted to get people working from home and therefore you take the office business the 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 property business instead you know so i think FaceTime will be a huge huge thing and again we kind of breeze past quite quickly the benefits of having uh, Apple Music as a platform ready and Apple TV Plus and the pieces are all coming together now in the jigsaws to why they've been so busy buying live sports rights because obviously AR and live sports just is a perfect synergy right as long as the camera infrastructure is at the arenas and, and certain sports will clearly work better than others I mean boxing will be insane I would have thought anything that's close and courtside basketball that kind of thing it's going to be an awesome awesome experience isn't it Amazing. And I, I'm, I'm glad you said that, actually, because there's something that we forgot to mention before, which is kind of like how this device will actually look when you put it on. Um, so this is going to be, it's called a mixed reality device. And what that basically means is it's capable of something called AR and VR. So what it does is it, it takes images in real life and then displays them digitally to your eyes. And then you can input other information, digital information on top of that, or have a completely um digital experience so mm. completely immersive or or feel like you're in your own space um the, apparently they're going to have like a, a dial which will be similar to airpods max which will oh, kind of crown. allow yeah. you to kind of bring yeah it will kind of like shift you from ar to vr and back in this kind of imaginative way i i imagine there's a, a great scene in a film called Exerstein where they kind of blur they they go into a virtual game but you don't see it happening and I, I imagine it's going to be something kind of similar to this. Um, uh, yes, I so thought with, with the sport, basically, imagine you kind of have like this virtual screen where you're watching Apple Sports or Apple TV in your own home. And it's like this beautiful, at least 4K display and um, probably more because you've got across both eyes. But you want you want to go further. You want to get in the game. Maybe you've got a subscription or whatever it is. You just twist this dial and I imagine you kind of like get pulled into the scene and all of a sudden you're in a, a front row seat. And and that's that's going to be a game change for people. And imagine if you've got other people watching it, you know, in, in a virtual space in a front row seat, if you wanted it to be communal. Then you can have a chat with people who are interested in the same <laughs> thing and maybe afterwards, because you're in this now VR space, you can hop on the court and have a couple of shots for yourself, you know? And this kind of like blurring between experiences is is going to be very interesting. And you, you can imagine that's for sports, but you can imagine it for um, movies. You can imagine it for theater, for uh, filming uh, gigs and live music shows uh, and even esports. you know. Uh, I well, think I kind of imagine with the gonna music, be... certainly, it could almost be an access all areas kind of thing. You know, you can be backstage in the train dressing rooms. You know, it could be really, really in integrated. In per you know, you, you obviously, as you say, you buy a, a, a higher ticket or whatever, you know, you, you're a VIP ticket. But for that, then you get the full experience, not only of on stage, possibly even backstage as well. I mean, it's beginning to be mindless. You just trying to comprehend how far and how quickly this could develop is really exciting. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. 
I mean, I I never thought about the kind of backstage element, but you know, you it would it could open up whole new revenue streams where you have like artists with super fans yeah. who are allowed to come and watch them in a recording session, yeah. Yeah. you know, or have a special hangout and they can communicate with them or this. I mean, th- this is why it's a new platform because it opens up all of these opportunities. And of course, gaming. Now, late in the stage of development, we're told that they are really big on the idea of gaming. And you made a really, really good point. You said earlier on that it's going to be running an M2 chip, and that's partly for the reason that I'll let you explain. It suddenly makes the AAA games a real reason for developers to now begin making for Apple. Yeah. Um, so, gaming. <laughs> we're basically, we're not... This new information about gaming only came out recently. For the whole time, there was almost nothing when it came to understanding gaming. I mean, me and Bradley, it's Bradley thought maybe they would do a partnership with Valve or something like that, and for Steam Store or 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 whatever. Um, but apparently, there's been some new information recently where there is a big gaming focus on this. And I hope I hope it's not just an iPad gaming focus and actually actually kind of like new games, but. So, for instance, apparently Hideo Kojima is going to be at WWDC, and that's kind of like a big thing. He's, he's the guy who created Metal Gear Solid, um, and he's known for innovating in games. And so it may just be that uh, he's there to, say, bring a new game onto Mac, but I don't know. that, that That's a very interesting thing. But what were you talking about the N2? So developing games for um, Apple devices hasn't been easy because... Uh, first of all, they weren't really built for games, but also uh, you had so many different chips and things like that. Now that you have like this unified chip process, you have so many more devices that have this standardized power of the N2 chip, which makes it a lot more attractive for a AAA studios to develop games for the devices basically now. Um, it kind of opened up a whole new market. So I also imagine if, you, if you've done the work to develop for the headset, then it might not take too much to switch it over. Um, for something like the laptop. Um, but this, by the way, that that information came from uh, somebody called Six on uh, Twitter, who's big in the XR space. He created some XR fitness app to point this out, and it's it's a really great point. And so this this really could be our whole kind of like venture into gaming. Um, mm-hmm. And as we know, gaming sells a lot of VR headsets right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great for fitness and all this kind of stuff. Um, so so we'll see. I, we know for sure that they're going to be leveraging their kind of fitness workout video. Of course, in this, yeah. Um, which, which already tells you a lot about how the hardware of the device can be. If they're confident someone can work out in it, then it's got to be light and comfortable. Um, so that one I really, I, I don't know much about, but I, I really hope it. Well, again, some, the workouts is, is something I should have mentioned because I, I, I don't know, it's my imagination running away with me, but I can, t- assuming it is light enough to wear during an Apple, and I do an Apple fitness workout every day. And I can just imagine suddenly if we're in the depths of winter here and it's snowy here, you could suddenly be in a beautiful, warm climate, having a run in a park or a nature reserve or in the in the studios with the workout guys. You know, you could do a workout alongside the trainers, couldn't you? It could be so much more real. I mean, it's already good. Their camera work is so good. But this would take it to another level again. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and uh, I can I can totally see uh, them. I mean, I look. I think people love that personal experience. But say you wanted to have a personal trainer, maybe you could mm. have either mm-hmm. somebody who ju- you jump into a session with a few people, or maybe it's an AI personal trainer who uses the data from the sensors to look at your form and suggest ways yeah. to make it better and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's a, it's a whole new paradigm shift. I mean, the thing is, is, you just have so much data coming off this off the people wearing these headsets now, as long as it's used safely. Um, it opens up for, you know, amazing experiences for us. So. so that's kind of what we're thinking we're going to get at the announcement and when we see it, hopefully, after all this, I, I do hope they bloody show it. I can't believe they're not. It seems like it's a nailed uncertainty. At least we're going to see it next Monday at WWDC. But how quickly do you think, just before we sort of wrap things up, how quickly do you think they're going to iterate on this? Say in this first, let's assume maybe it comes to market, actually physically we can get our hands on it early next year. Maybe it sounds reasonable, I would have thought. Announce it now, kind of again, Apple Watch-ish, maybe late this year, early next 
how think quickly do you think they're going to be in developing to the non-pro version of it? And how quickly do you think developers will get on side developing full 3D apps for it? I mean, I um, so I think probably they'll release the headset soonish. My guess is this year at some point. Um, and then the the device, which will be cheaper, I reckon will come out next year. They probably already had it in development now. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just want to give kind of like a good year to developers to develop enough of a library. They, they will have a select group of developers already, though, that they're working with right now who will have created some applications right. as well as the in, in-house applications that they made. So they, they'll have a library of applications and games, I imagine, on launch, um, which will then also be followed by all the iPad apps, which will also be available on launch. Um, and my guess is they'll probably just get headsets into the hands of developers first so that they can start, you know, maybe they'll shift developer headsets on, on Monday. Uh, and then do the release later. But my guess is probably a year behind will be enough time to generate more interest in this product at a lower price point. Um, maybe what we're actually seeing is 3000 is for the Pro and 1600 kind of will be mm. the... Consumer level. The price of the lower headset level. Yeah. But also, apparently, they're working on Pro Mark II already, um, which will be almost full human... Uh, so 16. Maybe not across your full Echo V. Yeah. Yeah. But apparently so. And that might they might just do that by stacking displays, you know. Mm. Um but so we'll So but the glasses but five to ten years out. Are, like, just they're because not Yeah. I mean there's so I mean there's just nothing to the glasses. I mean everything's gonna have to be in the glass itself. And you can imagine all of that data having to be in a in a uh, you know, what we know as a pair of specs right now. It's just crazy things you say. That's a long way down the line. But I mean Hell, let's not begin raining on the party because if half of what we've talked about here comes out next Monday and becomes something that is a reality, I was trying to think of another word because it's a bad <laughs> play on words, but if, if it becomes a reality <laughs> next week, what we're talking about here, suddenly we've just, what with this year having AI really stamped its mark and then possibly AR moving forward, this is going to be a massive year, isn't it? A massive year for technology. Huge, yeah, yeah, huge. And I think that's a really good point, David, which is that um, for me, this technology just works perfectly hand in hand with AI mm. uh, because it, it it provides all that richness of data for the AI to enhance your experience uh, and your productivity, basically. You know, mm. for me, the technology just represent kind of like the evolution, AI is the evolution of software. Uh, these ex- It's just the evolution of computer screens and things like this, you know. And so for me, they work very well together. And so if Apple jumps on that AI train as fast as they can and weaves it into the headset, they'll have a winning combination, uh, in my opinion. Funny enough, a blog I've just written today, and if you want to check it out, it's over on Medium or my website. But I was there was this conception that Apple are behind the game, behind the curve with AI. They're really not. <laughs> they, I mean, A, all the data they've got going with crash detection and, you know, everything that's going with Apple Watch, all the wearables. And, and now with the, the, the AR, VR headset coming out, they are no, they just haven't done the whole showboating thing. You know, they haven't done the chat GPT. They've been working very quietly in the background, getting their AI right. And it's going to be so integral to the launch of this product, isn't it? I, I think that we will definitely see at least like an improved theory, which will be their, their AI. And you're right, they've got teams and teams of some of the smartest people, some of the uh, some of the, the kind of top uh, AI engineers and already yeah. working on their products for years. So for sure, they've got something in the background. But I would also say that the pace at which AI is going and and how it's already being integrated into people's lives through chat GTT and things like that. I do think that there is a time limit on this, which is something that Apple hasn't really faced before. You know, they had the time to come out to market with a good product, but mm. I don't think that works the same with AI. I, I really think that you've got to get out there quick so that people can start to use it and get used to it. Um, but like you said, I mean, if they release something this WWDC, I think that's well within their time frame. How are they going to fit all this in, David? You know, they've got initial product, <laughs> headset, AI. Don't know. Yeah, I mean, and we know they've got to cover iOS, tvOS, iPadOS, iOS, Mac, plus the, it's going to be a long, long event. And we only need to, I mean, it's now clear why any other year, any other year, you, you can't tell me they would have made a feature at WWDC out releasing Logic and Final Cut for iPad 
at an event and it's just done on a Tuesday press release. All these accessibility features they've just released as well, again, via press release. I mean, I'm checking their press room every morning now to make sure I'm not missing something because so much big news is coming out just casually, which means they clearly mm. have to make as much space as they can. Now, it's going to be a long event though, isn't it? Uh, I reckon so. It starts at six. Uh, hopefully not too late because I have to go out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, for, for as birthday, to what but... our little secret, yes, of course it is your birthday next Monday. So yeah, we'll be letting you go quick. Now, we alluded to a little secret, a little plan that Marcus and I have got up our sleeves. What we think we're going to do um, is we are going to sit and record watching WWDC live. So you're going to get Marcus's reaction the minute they say something. And as soon as WWDC, this part of the event finishes, at least where they've announced a headset, we're going to have a chat. Marcus will summarize why he thinks they've gone the way they've gone, what are the good bits, the bad bits, the indifferent bits, everything he can see. We're going to try and summarize it all for you, be one of the first, hopefully, to get a video up. So that'll be going up, I hope, <laughs> technology and bandwidth allowing, uh, Monday night around about 9, 30, 10 o'clock, we should have a video up with Marcus summarizing everything he's heard at WWDC. So now we've just got to sit and wait, really. We've done the talking. You've drawn the renders. It's a case of waiting for six days, yeah. and it's going to become a, yeah, a thing. I just want to preference those renders, okay? They they are uh, kind of like a tester, just in a in a kind of form that that I like. Don't expect to see this uh, at at WDBC. They've got a team of designers. This is just my interpretation. Um, it's going to look very different. Bring it to a YouTube as well. It's almost clickbait. We've all got that little license where you just make something look good. If you've drawn some renders that you know may have been absolutely factually correct but look rubbish no one would be interested the fact that you've drawn beautiful renders that are probably going to be somewhere near truthful anyway you've got to have some license i'm going to give you a break on that one better to, better to than to promise and um, deliver <laughs> <laughs> well we will find out in six days time where everything has fallen so marcus thanks so much for joining me on this video and uh don't have too much birthday bubbles until wwdc get the recording done and then you can go and really let your hair down and you've got plenty of hair to go and let down so <laughs> yeah <laughs> hopefully so looking forward to it david I'll, I'll see you monday it's been great thank you and uh, thank you for watching and we'll see you monday evening after wwdc see you then